Welcome to this One Sky Overall Community Speaker Series, uh, which has been a joint uh, project of Renison University College and the Waterloo Public Library this past year, um, and it's been interesting to move it online. In keeping with Renison's commitment to the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, and particularly in light of the unmarked graves of Indigenous children that are being discovered across Canada at the locations of Indigenous schools, uh, residential schools. I want to begin with a land acknowledgement and I would encourage each of you uh, in this virtual gathering this evening to recognize and to honor the territories you are occupying. Renison University College acknowledges that our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our institution is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles each side of the Grand River. And our active work towards reconciliation takes place through research, learning, teaching, community building and outreach centralized within our Truth and Reconciliation Working Group, as well as the University of Waterloo's Indigenous Initiatives Office. I want to say a little bit about Renison. Uh, we are affiliated with the University of Waterloo. Students live in our residence, but study in all the faculties across the campus. And students who are registered at Renison earn University of Waterloo degrees. Our motto is the Latin phrase, uh, sed quellum solum, one sky over all. And we see a world in which all of us exist under the same sky, in which each one of us deserves to be treated with dignity and where as a community we strive for equity and justice, celebrating diversity and working to transform our world. I'm the chaplain at Renison and I've been there for the past 15 years. This is actually going to be my last summer. I am leaving uh, to return to the church world uh, after this. And I spent much of that 15 years working with students, not only at Renison, but across U Waterloo's campus. Probably about two thirds of my time is spent uh, listening and supporting students as they sort through issues of identity and vocation and as they seek to make sense of this world. There has been a lot of conversation on campus this year from instructors and professors, I'm sure you can imagine that, about what it's been like to move university education online. Uh, but tonight, I want to speak with those who have been impacted most of all, the students. The four students who have agreed to speak this evening to be part of this panel are articulate, reflective, and self-aware. Certainly as we prepared for this evening's discussion, I was struck by their insights. And I hope that you will also find this evening engaging and thought-provoking. I am going to ask each of them to introduce themselves to you briefly. And then we have some focus questions we're going to discuss as a group. Um, but I would invite you throughout that time uh, using the Q&A function to offer comments, ask questions. Mostly we'll leave that to the end, but we certainly will be keeping an eye on that uh, Q&A area. So if there are things that come up that are directly impacting our conversation, we would certainly want to engage. So let me begin uh, by calling on Kendra to introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, as Megan said, my name is Kendra. Uh, I'm a graduate student in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies at uh, the University of Waterloo. Um, my affiliation with Renison comes from my undergraduate degree. Uh, I minored in social development studies, which is run through Renison University College. Um, yeah, and I started my master's uh, degree during the pandemic. So I started this fall. So it's certainly been uh, interesting and a bit of a wild ride to start studying uh, in the midst of everything, uh, but I uh, definitely gained uh, some insight and uh, I think some interesting um, knowledge throughout. So I'm excited to share that tonight. Viola, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Okay, I didn't realize I'm the second one, but <laughs> I'm Viola and I'm a fourth year student with the University of Warlai Oats. I'm studying in that. And I'm also with the uh, co-op program and I'm actually graduating next year, which I hope I'm, I'm going to have a in-person convocation. 
and <laughs> and uh, I've done um, I guess two terms of study in online and also two terms of co-op online. So I got some experience, um, online experience, both study in and also working experience. And I'm um, glad to join this meeting. And Bethany. Um, so hello, my name is Bethany. I am also in my fourth year uh, at Waterloo in social development studies which um, as Kendra mentioned is housed at Renniston. It's an interdisciplinary degree. So it sort of, it covers social work, psychology and sociology. Um, and then I'm also living at home and enjoying that difficulty. And I also work um, in a grocery store. So that has certainly been interesting to balance between the two of them, school and work, especially in these times. And last but not least, Devin. Uh, hello, um, my name is Devin. I have just finished my undergraduate degree in geography and environmental management at Waterloo. Um, I'm associated with Renison. I've been through the St. Bede's Chapel community, which I've been a part of since my first year. Um, over the pandemic, I have had both school and work terms online and will now be convocating online on Friday. So that's, that's great, Devin. I forgot it was this week that you're convocating. That's awesome. So we do have um, some questions that we have developed as a group. So we're going to move through those. Um, as I said, if there are comments or uh, questions that, that anybody else listening has, please put it into the Q&A section. We'd be glad to engage. We wanted to start by talking about our understanding of wellness. If we are going to talk about what life has been like uh, as a student during this pandemic, then I'm hoping that people can also say something about how you understand wellness and how have you maintained your wellness this year or how have you not? <laughs> Either side of that. And we're going to begin with Kendra saying a few words. Thanks, Megan. Uh... Yeah, as a recreation and, and leisure student, wellness is certainly something um, I think about a lot. And, and especially during the pandemic, I think some of my uh, positions and, and understandings of wellness ha have certainly gone through some changes and, and evolutions. Um, so, so I think for me, um, wellness involves meanings of connection and, and stability within those connections. Uh, at least within social media spaces and, and spaces that we're interacting with a lot these days, wellness and self-care are used interchangeably a lot of the time. And, and imagery that accompanies uh, those terms is usually like like house plants and, and candles and, and bubble baths. And, and I don't wanna like pretend or imply that I'm above these coping tactics or, or don't find value in them because I certainly do. Uh, but what I've noticed is that when wellness is marketed as self-care, it, it's centered around the individual and, and individual experiences and, and particularly like short-lived uh, stimulation of the senses, right? You have like sight, smell, touch. Um, but what I've learned throughout the pandemic is that for me, uh, wellness goes much farther beyond that. And, and particularly it's linked to connection and a specific a uh, type of connection that is consistent and something that you can rely on. Um, I, I saw a post recently on, on Facebook that um, really resonated with me and it was from a Muslim community organizer and, and researcher named uh, Kale uh, Nikita Valario. Mm -hmm. uh, and it read, um, it read shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. And after looking into it more, I, I found that uh, quote circulated in 2019 um, after the Churchill Mosque shootings in New Zealand. Uh, but of course, uh, as I said, that quote really resonated with me, particularly in the context of the way that we're currently living and existing. And I think what's really contributed to my wellness this year is taking the time to seek out community, even in unexpected places or ways. And the, and the two things that come to mind the most is I've made a habit of going for a walk after dinner every evening. Mm 
And because I go at the same time, I tend to see the same people every day. Uh, so then we kind of have these very brief um, encounters each day where we like smile or say hello. Uh, and like similarly in the winter, I would walk on the same path every day. And I noticed, I started to notice like small patterns um, like there were these like woodpeckers that would be on certain trees at certain times of the day. And it seems like kind of funny, but I found that these routine encounters with nature or land or neighbors to be quite grounding and stabilizing in moments when like world events or personal life or school seemed really overwhelming. Uh, so that's been my main takeaway and my understanding um, of wellness and how it's developed and evolved uh, throughout the pandemic. But yeah, I'd be interested to hear everyone else's insights as well. I'm curious to hear some of Bethany's comments, because one of the things you guys will not know as much, but when Bethany and I do connect on Zoom all through this, um, I get to see her bird feeders and her birds. There is quite the collection. So Bethany, I'd be curious to hear some of your thoughts on that. Um, it's really interesting because I was recently in a meeting and we were asked to reflect on what the most, what gift we have been given by being through the pandemic or what has been one thing that we appreciate about it and everyone was mentioning you know oh we're going on more bike rides we're going outside um I a little impulsively bought a kayak last year um and then I also got really into bird watching as Megan said um so I have about seven bird feeders now and it's not going to slow down anytime soon um, because I just keep finding more that I need. But I think that there really is something um, key about reconnecting with nature that we haven't, um, because so much of our life is on a screen right now, I think that there's a key point about being out in nature that a lot of us are rediscovering right now. And that connects into the community piece, I suspect, as well, right? The sense of being connected to something outside just yourself. Devon or Viola, I'm curious to hear. I personally don't think I am um, really managing it. I am surviving it. Yeah. And I'm trying to make some change recently because I just find... Um, like I also go for a walk, walk um, usually, and um, and I think that's still a quite below the normal um, exercise amount if it's not a pandemic. So um, I recently using a um, app um, called Keep, and I'm doing some exercise over there. And also I kind of um, also um, I've stopped playing piano for a while because I'm lazy. <laughs> so I just decided to take some lessons um, online. And that would also give me something to kind of um, enjoy myself and uh, also something to um, keep track of my um, activities. As most online lessons, you can do at any time. So I don't have a very scheduled, although I do have a schedule, but I can't really follow it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I hope I will improve during summer. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Absolutely. Well done. Devin. One of the things I found really helpful has been finding structure where I can. And so like appreciating things a little bit more maybe cyclically than I otherwise would have. Like I have church on Sundays. I was last year I did a kind of online <laughs> version of the Great British Bake Off with friends across four time zones. And every two weeks, like clockwork, I knew that I had something to bake. And so it was like that kind of combination of community and good food and like just having that kind of structure mm -hmm. was very useful for me. And like having to acknowledge that maybe I do need to tell myself, you need to leave the house every day which I wouldn't necessarily have done before, but I'm like, that's creating different pockets, figuring out what activities serve what functions in my life and making sure there is a balance of them, um, even when they change or even when like mm -hmm. they necessarily have to be different because of school challenges or whatever, um, figuring out how to keep those all going was important. 
the amount, I mean, I'm listening to each of you, right? And the amount of intentionality and self-reflection that that has all taken, right? Um, like I, just to pick up on your last piece, Devin, right? The idea that the, looking at all the activities you normally, quote, normally would do outside of a pandemic and thinking about what does that actually do for me? Why do I do those activities? Which, who are the people even that I connect with, right? Like I'm really struck by all of that. And I'm thinking in the middle of all of that, like I look at the four of you and I think, also, living circumstances have been so different for all of you, right? In terms of what you thought perhaps this year would be like. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to chime in. Oh, yeah, De Bethany is just nodding away like crazy, having already made the reference to having moved home. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I enjoy being able to pay for school outright. So I have been lucky enough to live at home. Um, but I think that uh, the concept of recontextualizing what this year means has definitely been like, I didn't expect to be going into my last year of university without having stepped on campus in the last, you know, year and a bit. Like, um, I, when I left campus back last March, I was really starting to find my footing in building a community and, you know, like I was in some small classes and I felt like I could really get to know my classmates and then we were all online. Um, now, like I also think uh, because I work at a grocery store, which has been open the entire time, I've certainly been really lucky because I have not lost a certain amount of like um, interaction um, with people and just also like on a friendly just seeing people around that I know and recognize um, I really have seen that as a great joy and strength from working in some pretty interesting times uh, but I think that we just like recontextualizing what this year meant what did it what does it mean to have a birthday um because i managed to sneak by last march without having to have a pandemic birthday and it was like haha you suckers who are born in may you're gonna have a lockdown birthday <laughs> and then coming up to this birthday and realizing okay no actually this is like how do i do this right now mm -hmm. what very do much. I do? well very much connects both to Devin you talking about how do you mark convocation um right I mean that's a whole other piece to try and mark those things or I'm thinking about Kendra who's done her first year of her uh, graduate degree without really being on campus <laughs> yeah and I had the online convocation last year uh for my undergrad as well uh so yeah kind of uh marking an end to a big event like that and then starting another chapter also online it felt like I never really finished my undergrad it felt like I just kind of went into year six I guess because I did co-op um, during my undergrad so so yeah and, and I relate to um, Bethany about about being home and the, and the challenges of that because um yeah, I hadn't been at home because I was in co-op. Um, I hadn't been home for more than a few weeks in like over five years. And then all of a sudden I've been at home for like eight months. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my, my grandmother was living with us as well. So so we had it's kind of like three generations with three different routines. And of course, we're all um, having different reactions to the pandemic um, because we're from different eras and we've all been been raised differently and have different ideas about how to handle things and how much news to watch and what we should be engaging with or taking a break from. Uh, so that's certainly created challenges, uh, yeah, since I've been home. But I'm also really fortunate um, to, to be home and to be in an area that's uh, fairly small and uh, there hasn't been as many restrictions here. Uh, so there's there's definitely positives to it as well. 
Well, and then the opposite is both Viola and Devon, who actually did stay in Waterloo, both of you, right? And Viola, for you, that means, I mean, you weren't necessarily expecting to be able to go home in this time period, but it really has has stopped any traveling around for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I definitely wish that maybe um, next year I had a chance to go home, especially after I graduate. I'm planning for a two month vacation at least. <laughs> and um, so, but um, actually I'm grateful for that having a roommate um, that we actually have some good time together and watching TV shows <laughs> together. And, uh, and the living habits of both of us um, cooperate well. So that's definitely a good thing. And I think um, Devin would echo this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. My, I live with one roommate and she's the best. So <laughs> that helps. <laughs> I think it's remarkable both you and Viola are still saying that after all this time of being at home together. <laughs> yeah, and we were at home, like doing online school from home, online work from home for the last year straight. So we were the only people, people the others saw for the full year. And we still like each other, which I count as a success. I think that's remarkable. I'm going to move us on a little bit, um, just because I'm looking at the time as well. And, and this was uh, an observation, actually, that Kendra made when we were talking, right? This idea that actually, I mean, it happens that our whole panel tonight all identifies female, right? We are all women. Um, and so I wonder if we can just talk a little bit, just touch briefly, perhaps on women's wellness and the pandemic. Uh, what might be things, right, that women maybe have experienced differently in this pandemic time? What might be some, some particular perspectives that you guys would have as women? Um, and I'm wondering maybe Kendra, because this was your observation in the first place. I'm gonna start with you again. Uh, sure, thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, when, when, when thinking about wellness and gender and pandemic experiences and stuff, I, I think to start off, like, you should acknowledge that wellness is gendered term and you can see this um in in the way that wellness is like marketed to men and women especially if we're thinking in these kind of hegemonic like binary structures of gender um and when we're thinking about wellness you can see the way that like health food and, and fitness is is marketed and, and sold and and how like even relationships and friendships are marketed and sold and how we sell these performances of gender coupled with well-being to each other in the way that we interact and behave in our relationships and friendships. So, so I think for me personally, I can't really detach or extract my position as a woman from my experiences and understanding of wellness or unwellness or my experiences in the pandemic. And we've learned from like women's crisis centers like across the country, um, that stay at home orders have aggravated or, or intensified um, instances of, of domestic violence. So that's a more overt um, example. But I, I think the pandemic has also created more covert challenges uh, for, men, for women as well. Um, particularly in my research and, and in my academic background, I think about space and place and public spaces and movement in public spaces um, a lot. So I've been thinking about as a woman, I'm usually hyper aware of space and how much space I'm taking up, how much space is around me, who is around me. And prior to COVID, especially when I was in Waterloo, I would gravitate towards spaces and, and public places where there would be other people around, particularly at night. Uh, and that was as a safety precaution. But now, because of the times that we're living in, when I see a group of people, I tend to avoid them. So, so it creates this extra uh, emotional and, and mental burden of trying to navigate and optimize space. Uh, so that's been my number one observation for me personally. Um, but yeah, I'm sure the rest of the panel has other uh, insights as well. Who would like to jump in? Bethany, I'm thinking about your work at the grocery store, right? <laughs> yeah, I, like I don't want to generalize it, but um, it certainly is uh, interesting when bringing up gender to note. Um, I work as a cashier and the vast majority of cashiers are also female. Um, some of them are young, 
there are lots of moms with families and it has been very interesting, especially because those, um, the job of, you know, like as a cashier has a very low status societally. Um, and so it was definitely like, it was a job and it was a consistent job and you could count on it, but it was more likely to be a support job than it was to be a job that the entire family depended on. Um, and when everything got shut down, I know lots of people um, who I work with, they're, they were the only one who still had a job because all construction closed. And that, uh, from my own family experiences, I know that that shift of who is the quote unquote breadwinner can be very uncomfortable. Um, and is another thing to sort of uh, handle as we're also going through this extremely traumatic experience. Um, and there's also an element uh, as a cashier where you are walking people through that trauma because you are the only you know, stranger that people see once a week or every two weeks. And so not only are you experiencing your own trauma, but you are also continually um, talking with people while they are like dealing with their trauma and trying to find normalcy in that. And so that has definitely been um, both a great gift because it has been, you know, so fantastic to talk to so many people and get into them. I mean, going back to wellness, I remember at the beginning of this, I did not go into work without having checked the COVID numbers and checked the news. And then there came a point because I couldn't cope with all of the different people saying various fear mongering nonsense. And so I wanted to have the facts, at least for me. Um, and then there came a point when that was more detrimental to my health than it was helpful. Um, and having to find that, walk that situation too. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that regardless of gender, lots of people have really found, right? They have to kind of limit as the, the 15 months has gone on, the, the, there has to be a limit to the news feed and pieces. But that's a really interesting piece that the work that you're doing and, and, and just at a whole other level, all of the shifts, right? From what we thought uh, life looked like and our assumptions and our habits and the pandemic's just taken them and, and switched them all upside down. I don't know, Devin or Viola, do you want to add in anything? Any thoughts around the gender piece? No, not particularly from Devin. Okay. Viola, anything from you? No? Okay. Then, then let's talk about last March, right? A year ago in March, uh, when everything shifted online, just all of a sudden, right? I mean, it felt like one week I was having conversations with students in which they were like, can you believe it? Everywhere's shutting down. We won't shut down. They'll keep us going till at least the end of term. <laughs> Look at Devon. She's guffawing at the very thought of that memory. I can remember students saying that to me though, right? It's only three weeks till the end of term or whatever it was at that point. Um, surely they'll keep us until then. And all of a sudden, right, we all moved online. So, so I'm wondering both some of your own memories of that and what that shift was like, and also to talk a little bit about the difference for you in terms of the experience of being a university student and learning, the learning piece, right? The pedagogical piece. What's it been like to learn online versus learning in person? Um, and, and we're gonna start off, I think, with Bethany on that one. Yes. So um, for me, certainly, uh, I have always worked at the same time as I've gone to school. That has been a very good balance for me and very important for me in keeping balance. Um, so it was not, uh, the, like, I just, I honestly did not even think about not working once the pandemic happened. Um, which was funny because we lost people left, right, and center. Um, and like, there was just no part of me that had thought about that. But I do remember like having to send an email to my prof about um, 
the, that like first week when she was like, okay, so we're moving everything off. And I had already agreed to work a 40 hour week because the university had announced that we were off for a week and then we'd come back online. However, that was going to be, um, and having to say, I work at a grocery store and things are insane. And I don't like, I can't do this. Like, uh, here's the university that said this, and this is why I did it. But um, if you're gonna require this, like I will need an extension and having to continually go back to that. Uh, for instance, uh, one of my friends got COVID in September um, and she's also one of my coworkers. And that was really, really difficult because it really hit home in a way that it had not. Um, so that's been like my personal experience about like what it was like moving online. In terms of pedagogy, I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> um, I, a lot of my coursework is centered around discussions and discussion posts. And that is, I like, for the degree, it makes a lot of sense, but there is, Megan and I were talking about this yesterday, there is an assumption that discussions online are as good as discussions in person. And I think that they are two very different things. Um, and there is also an assumption that you are available at all times with asynchronous learning that is not necessarily true. So I know I had some courses that expected me to be doing discussion posts every single day for five days, three weeks in a row. And that, because my way of doing school involved having days where I did school work and days where I did work, it was very difficult. And I don't think that it's particularly healthy to have this expectation that students will be 100% online all of the time, especially when we don't change the expectations from in class. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you've done quite a lot of thinking and talking with me about that piece, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Devin, I'm curious, because you're in such a different discipline, right? Um, in you coming out of geography, what was the experience of going online in your, you know, in that term, like? Yeah, um, a lot of it was, we did have some discussion posts, but I think my professors were more reasonable about it, maybe, <laughs> than yours seem to have been, which, uh, for which I'm grateful. I, I am that weird person who kind of likes them, so I, what I say should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but, like, the thing I've missed most in kind of the schooling piece is the aspect of like social learning situations where I mean I think I learned as much um, studying in a coffee shop or doing sitting in the labs with classmates not only like learning from them and how they could explain things to me but being able to help them with things and that kind of those kind of transactions um, were really good for learning and just overall general enjoyment of of getting all of that knowledge in so like I do miss that I feel like that's one piece of it that's definitely been a lot harder to maintain and I know some people have um, some people did a better job of being really intentional and like we're meeting on zoom at this time we will all do our writing and what have you but I think those kind of the extensions of classroom learning that happened with classmates got lost a lot in that there's something even about just that that it, i mean yes it can be replicated to a certain extent with the intentionality but a lot of the coffee shop and and just sitting around you know the same table and doing stuff or in a study space on campus is a very it's not necessarily just the intentional as we work on this particular project, right? It's all the side conversations that happen around that that also help clarify. Um, certainly as somebody who's fairly extroverted and who learns, has always learned um, through being around other people, right? I'm not a primarily um, independent on my own learner. So yeah, I think that's a huge piece. Viola, though, I'm thinking about math, right? You are our math student here. So 
is math easy if it goes online or has that also been difficult? Um, I think I need to compare the, 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 the difficulty level when it's actually offline, but I'm taking new course, courses every term. So, and I didn't retake any, so I really don't know. But uh, I remember the time when, um, when the school is officially going online. It's around the time when there are midterms. And there were three midterms in that week and all of them got canceled. And I almost feel that's a hallucination. <laughs> and I was so excited because <laughs> they are canceled. And I was planning for two nights in at library already, but that doesn't exist anymore. So I'm really glad for that part. And, um, but the thing is also that for finals, they are like take home finals, which, which like I, I think people would generally, generally find this more, um, less stressful for them. And um, I think the thing for this type of study and or doing exam is like you, you feel you have like unlimited time of study almost, but actually you are um, like your day still consists of 24 hours. Probably you get an hour or two back that you don't have to commute, um, but still it's like a limited time somehow. And that really affects the, the ability of focus uh, for, at least for me. And I think also it's, it's a flatter experience of studying. Like when you are doing lessons in, um, like in class, you probably see in the professor maybe writing equations and telling you how to prove something. And it's not only just information you saw from a paper, but actually there is facial expression, there's body language. And also these are also a kind of a language that does convey information and also helps you to focus on something you really need to focus. And I think a really important part of studying is also knowing what are the important things to kind of um, maybe notice to kind of put more time to study. And, um, and I'm also kind of trying to, um, I guess, uh, rehab it, I don't know, uh, kind of teaching myself how to kind of co compensate that part. So, yeah, and um, I think there are also good things, like you definitely can, um, there's like two way, like you can wake up later for lessons because you there's no fixed time for a lecture. But um, but the thing is you can wake up too late and you don't have enough time to, to study all the things you planned for today. And then you, you probably are being night owl for a long time during the pandemic. But I usually to be a morning person. So um, I think there's also things I should learn is um, to be more self-disciplined and especially probably in the future, not only study, but also work in a big dynamic, like both happening in person, but also online. It's something, probably a skill everyone should work on. I'm really struck though, but that even in math, it's a help to have an instructor or professor because part of what you pick up is which pieces do you really need to pay attention to? I don't think that had ever occurred to me. I mean, it's so obvious when you say it, right? Like, yeah, we all know that when the prof emphasizes certain things, you think, oh, okay, really notice this piece, read that section in the textbook, make sure that I do. And they're going to test it. <laughs> Yeah, but when there's not, it's much harder to know which pieces to really, that's a really, it's just fascinating that that's, I mean, I know that that's also true in math, but I don't think we think of it as being as true in math. Yeah. I think it's been really interesting to hear both Devin and Viola both um, make note of how uh, we've really separated our different sections of what we're learning um, instead of moving towards a more holistic approach, which I would say is what we have been trying to do. Certainly as I've gotten older, the idea of teaching the whole child instead of just worrying about the academics um, has come more into uh, the mainstream. And the idea about things like uh, the unwritten curriculum mm -hmm. uh, being a part of that. And I think it's really interesting that the minute that we switch online, we go right back to, we only have this and we're not like, for as much as my profs might say, you know, make sure that you take care of yourself. We're really missing a lot of these different little things 
that we had started to get a more holistic approach in education. I wonder if partly we just don't know how to do that piece online yet, right? We, what we know how to do is to do the academics or at least in at some level, but we're not sure how to do the rest. Really curious to hear Kendra talk a little bit about both what it was like this year to go into being a grad student totally online, but also the experience of being a TA, right? Because you were also on the other side of all of that, yes? <laughs> Yeah, um, hearing Bethany talk about her disdain for uh, discussion boards, I really felt that because I had to mark discussion boards and it was equally <laughs> an unpleasant experience for me too, marking all those. Um, but yeah, going back to what Bethany was saying about uh, our focus on academics, that reminded me of an email everyone in Waterloo received right at the beginning when things were just starting to shut down. And we got an email saying that only activities essential to the academic mission will continue. And I remember everyone like laughing about that and that like turned into a meme and like there were t-shirts that was made that you can buy on campus saying like, I'm essential to the academic mission. Um, but yeah, Bethany, that that's definitely like a really good insight that we have managed to move the academic portion online kind of successfully, maybe not so depending on who you talk to, but definitely the social connection pieces and the pieces that really make the student experience enjoyable and, and worthwhile are, are taken away because well, when I think about starting my master's program, like I was looking forward to like all the clubs and activities and, and, and stuff that really makes the student experience and, and makes wellness improve for students. Because when you think about the structure of university, um, aside from like the stress and, and workload of, of classes and stuff, there are definitely safety nets, built-in safety nets in place that can like contribute to your wellness. Um, if you take that step to engage in classes and, and clubs and activities. Uh, but then this year, that was just all kind of ripped out from underneath us, and, and we were on our own. And I definitely feel what Devin and um, what Devin was saying about uh, being disciplined and the struggle of being disciplined, uh, because yeah, the student experience is is quite a disciplined practice, especially when you're completely on your own, and it's just like you and your laptop and it's like okay like no one else is going to write this paper like I, I have to no one else is doing it around me so like you have to find like the inner kind of willpower um to do that and yeah I definitely felt conflicted throughout this year uh when I was marking students and marking discussion boards especially because I I understand the workload it was and I thought it was too much uh, but as a TA, there's you can make suggestions, uh, you, you can advocate on behalf of, of students, but at the end of the day, you don't write the curriculum. So you're just kind of having to give these marks out without having that personal connection and those conversations with your students. There's, I had like about 60 students in my section this past semester I did not meet a single one of them no one came to office hours so I've never like actually seen their faces uh, and that was a really weird experience of dictating their mark in a class without ever having known them and ever really having like a meaningful chance to improve their academic experience or enhance their knowledge or, or get to know them personally in any way so yeah, I, I think that's definitely been a, a struggle and, and I, yeah, a, definitely an internal conflict for me. I wonder too, I mean, now for all of you, was it primarily asynchronous learning that was going on? Did that change at all over the last 15 months? Was there a switch at, no, I'm seeing some, what, what was that experience like? Because I mean, on the one hand, it was really done, my understanding, right, as a staff or employee at the university, my, but I don't teach. But my understanding was that that was primarily to allow 
for people who in different time zones who had other commitments so that you could still do your coursework right and yet one of the things bethany you're exactly right i'm very aware of from lots of students that actually the asynchronous piece meant that it just somehow ballooned right and it just felt like it was supposed to fill every moment um, now that was also harder because there were fewer other things to have around and then school commitments feel like they balloon. But I wonder about the rest of you, what was your experience of asynchronous learning? Uh, so my first semester uh, so fall was uh, completely asynchronous, um, apart from one class, uh, which did meet every other week, uh, which I really looked forward to. Um, but I think grad school is a little bit different because there's a lot more interaction there. It's a lot smaller program. So, so you can have um, more feedback and uh, discussions with professors about the structure of classes and stuff. So uh, during the second semester, it was all synchronous, which they went completely the opposite way. Uh, but I definitely enjoyed that a lot more. There were yeah, certain classes that I, I really look forward to. And, and I actually got to know my peers uh, a little bit. So um, yeah, I definitely value the uh, synchronous classes. It's interesting, right, Devin, you talked earlier, right, about trying to get like how important it was for you to have things that happened on particular days or at particular times. And, um, and I wonder about, I mean, were you also asynchronous classes or, or did you have some changes? How did that all look? Pretty much everything I had was asynchronous and even I think more so than a lot of classes would be because I was also working on my undergrad thesis. So right. like in my last term, in the winter term, I had this full credit course. So one of four where I had no schedules, no structure, no classmates. <laughs> so it was, it was entirely self-driven and at a time when everything else also requires you to be the only person setting and meeting deadlines, basically. Um, it makes you aware of how much energy goes into making and keeping agreements with yourself. I found that especially on my, uh, I did a co-op term in the fall and I was working as a research assistant for a professor uh, working on a paper and it could be two weeks between when I would speak with her so I would have these huge chunks of time where it was just me figuring out what I needed to be doing and when and how. And that was a change, but it's a new skill set. <laughs> so that's I such think a that's, good way of looking at it. <laughs> I, I think it's kind of getting chucked in the deep end uh, to, to some extent because you you have to learn to manage your time and yourself and be able to set boundaries and all of these things that that were a lot of that could be externalized before there were the cues of whatever physical environment you were in or all of these things and now all of that is on you um, and that's just a change I think that's true. I mean, I think it's very true for students. I think it was true for anybody else who was also working from home, right? I would say that as an employee, that one of the things I became terribly aware of was that when I sat down, every time I sit down at the computer, there are no other external cues. I am in the same room. I'm in the same study. It is the same computer in front of me. And I have to, I mean, I was saying this before we came online, right? I've had a day of online meetings. Every time I'm in a new meeting, there is no other cue except for who are the faces in front of me on the screen. Whereas usually, you know, you walk to a different building, you cross a, an area, you take a bus, you drive. I, I remember, Kendra, you said to me, so I think it was in the fall term, and you said, I keep remembering how you, we used to walk across campus and you would see people who you didn't really know, but you'd had one or two classes with, or you'd been in a club with, and you'd greet them. And you said to me, I don't even remember, how did we do that? <laughs> So all those external pieces, I think, really, really important and, and takes a lot of energy. Viola, what about you? How all that self-discipline piece? You you talked earlier, right, about having feeling like you'd gotten lazy. But I wonder if it's just not also really hard to do all of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I cope with this in the correct way, but I usually just stuff myself with a lot of things so that I have that I, I need to do something right now in mind in order to finish all I have in play in my place. But um, 
I, I, I still I can manage it, but um, it still some sometimes needs to needs you to kind of know um, how to make schedules that actually also give you time to do self care, especially when you are also in a cool term and you probably. Um, gonna searching for jobs and doing interviews at the same time, and um, usually the time when you have interviews is just right before you have the midterms, which could be something a little bit hard to cope with, and uh, so you need to kind of taking care of both sides. And also, as an introvert, I I know that I need time to recharge myself. So I think um, that's really multi multitasking <laughs> under that situation. And um, I think the tips are like schedules definitely help. And I even have my like desk desktop as my schedule. Like when should I do which class and um, maybe what time I should focus. And uh, I give some time for, also I leave time that in between that I don't like just kind of um, stuff my schedule with all the courses and also the things I should review. But I also give time that I can do anything during that time, whether it's maybe take a nap or go for a walk or probably just um, read a book or things like that. And um, I think the other, this, the other thing is also really important for me is to know what I feel right now. And there's a lot of self reflection that, um, can I do more things where I need some time to kind of take a break and also figuring out what are those stress come from because they're not necessarily <clears throat> all from um, studying or just being um, having too much things to do, but also can come, can come from a, a lot of like different aspects. Although you are not probably, you don't have a normal amount of interaction with people, but that, but there's, but I think that somehow makes um, human interaction um, a more burdensome somehow uh, during this time because um, you actually you don't have people to kind of you don't have um, people to go to every, like any time you want and sometimes those uh, like some human interaction that is unnecessary but not probably not something you completely enjoy that burden lies completely on you and that could also affect your um, maybe um, effectiveness, effectiveness or um, your efficiency in doing other things. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, Kendra, your opening comments around, you know, that, that quote around self-care um, and people really need community care, right? And sometimes, I, I think that's just really true. Sometimes we, we think about what are the things I can do and I can do for myself or do I need a break? Do I need to walk away from the screen? But we also, even introverts, <laughs> have a need for human interaction, right? Um, and so that's a beautiful segue into, because of course the other thing that went online this year was not just all our school <laughs> and all our work life. The other piece that went online uh, were all of our social interactions, all the friends. Um, so Devin, I'm gonna get you to start uh, in terms of responding. What, what has that been like? What are some of the surprises? What has it been like to do online socializing? In some ways, that's been one of the high points of the pandemic for me, um, because I got to stay in touch with people I wasn't necessarily expecting to stay in touch with, because when everything moves online, people you're not like geographically close to, um, if they've also moved online, that barrier is gone, <laughs> which was great. Um, so I did things like I was saying the, um, the Great British Bake Off facsimile with friends in a whole bunch of different places and I stayed in touch with the chapel community from the university where I went on exchange so that was really good. Um, one thing about the pandemic was it made me kind of think about different types of friends and I mean co-op already kind of makes you do this because you recognize when you're moving that often and going between seeing people and not seeing people you realize that like there are some people who you are friends with because of proximity and that's not a bad thing it's okay if all you have in common is that you sit next to each other in class like that's still a valuable relationship and it, it's just kind of like a different kind of friendship and there was no in co-op when you move to a new city or 
what have you for a job, you make those kinds of contacts again. But with the pandemic, I didn't find that that happened. So I found that it felt like there were significantly fewer people kind of around. Um, and I feel like in a lot of ways, a lot of people's support networks became much smaller than they had been, but also not like it could go either way, depending on what kind of contact you needed. So like, depending on what the challenges were or what have you, sometimes it was really useful to be able to reach out to a huge group of people um, and, and get support from people you can't, couldn't necessarily see in person. And sometimes it meant that you were a lot more involved with the people you did see all the time because they were the only people you saw. So th there was kind of that shift in dynamics too. Yeah, and those kinds of almost like not really acquaintance, more than an acquaintance, but you're right, the sort of the regular people that you meet up with, that circle kind of just vanished, right, in lots of ways. And yet other people you might not have expected to stay in touch with. Yeah, I mean, I was watching certainly both Kendra and Bethany nodding away at parts to that. I don't know if either of you want to jump in. Um, I had the like intense joy of um, my friend group from high school started doing basically a monthly Zoom. I never know when it is. I kind of just find out the day of because one of my friends messages me and it's like, hey, we're going on tonight. Um, but like we did a Halloween party where we were all trying to carve the weirdest squash and one of my friends had to get out a power drill to carve a spaghetti squash. Um, and just not that we don't keep in touch quite significantly, given that it's been, you know, more than 10 years since we've met. Um, but we are all over the place. Like I've got a friend, like one of them's in BC, the other one's, um, one of them's online right here, right now. Um, but she was in Toronto for a while. I've got one down in New York. Um, like they're just all over the place. And so it's been really cool to reconnect on a much more regular basis. And it's made me want to, when it's safe, make those, make the time to do that again in a different way way and I don't know that this would have happened if we'd just been able to meet up every Christmas. <laughs> That's yeah. Kendra. Yeah similar to Bethany I, I found that I'm consistently connecting with people that I didn't anticipate like talking to on a weekly basis after um, the after I graduated from my undergrad like of course I intended on keeping in touch with people but uh, my friends like but when I lived with them uh, they were really into board games and, and before the pandemic like I would play but like it wasn't like a consistent activity for me or, or like something I considered to be like super valuable or, or essential uh, but but when the pandemic started a group of my like really close friends started having online game nights and now it's like set like Saturdays 8 p.m like everyone knows it's game night and everyone just logs on and and it's a time to like catch up and, and talk to each other and like talk about our week and and share like news we have and stuff and and like we barely miss a week since last March um or March 2020 uh and, and I feel like we've created this like kind of like joyful fun like light space in this like digital void that like I kind of dread going on when I have like a lot of like online meetings or, or something like that so it's yeah it's something that like I've come that's been really surprising to me but also something that I've come to like really value and uh yeah I look forward to every week. Leola, what about, I mean, because your your family is all still, like, you're, you're an international student, here you are in Canada, what's it been like to try and, and keep in contact with family and friends, right? I mean, you were already doing some of that online, but. but yeah, so that about. part doesn't have a change, uh, like, there's been too much of a difference in that part, but um, 
a funny thing I noticed is that um, like me and my best friend, we usually don't do calls or FaceTime because it's just we're too similar and uh, doing calls and FaceTime just would be too re revealing and that makes us feel a little bit dangerous. So I don't know why this is more revealing than meeting in person. But <laughs> it's just, um, we're so similar. We didn't even talk about this. We just don't call each other. <laughs> and it's and fascinating, um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but during the pandemic, we kind of, I don't know, it's kind of break through the, um, the line or kind of stepping out of the comfort zone somehow. And we start doing some calls which is really good, but it's gonna like, it's really going gonna be like three hours over the phone and even more, which could be a little bit too much, but yeah, that is also a good experience. And also like personally, I don't do FaceTime um, like um, other than with my family, because I also feel as kind of my, uh, I don't know, it's like kind of my privacy zone, like doing, FaceTime is just how I feel, but I also find it's not act actually that bad because I actually did some FaceTime with uh, friends and even like not only colleagues, but also friends. And uh, it actually doesn't feel um, that, uh, I just, I, it's not that unacceptable, it's acceptable. And, <laughs> and I think it's also a growth for myself that I actually know that I can handle that level of conversation, which is good. It, it makes me actually think a little bit. I think it was you, Devin, at the start of, before we came online uh, officially and, and started the, the presentation. And you were talking about profs and getting to know profs a bit more informally because of the online piece. I mean, that's not connected to the trend piece, but I, if you don't mind just telling that story again, because that was quite something. <laughs> I was just saying um, kind of back to the, the piece on what like kinds of relationships with people and having gone from like what counts as uh, proper things in this day and age and I was at an event with my department and one of my professors I was having a conversation with him while he was making tacos for his four-year-old and I'm like <laughs> I right my professors are people with home lives and families and are now juggling all of these things and I feel like that goes a long way in the empathy piece, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, especially in schooling, because like it's it's a different relationship between um, like professors and students and TAs, even like Kendra was saying, um, where it's like seeing them also having to be sitting in their house dealing with all of the things um, is reassuring in some way. I, I know and entertaining. Well, and I know lots of profs or instructors have talked to me, you know, full of apologies, right? Because they've been teaching or they've been meeting with students and a kid has arrived on screen or or pets. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've met lots of people's pets over this last 15 months. But actually I, like I, don't, I love that stuff, right? Like and there is a sense, right, in which, oh, I'm not the only one who's trying to juggle because inevitably I don't have kids at home anymore, but inevitably my cat needs to leave the office where the door is shut as soon as I start talking to somebody, as soon as it happens. So it just is a relief that no, everybody else's life is a little chaotic too, right? <laughs> or a lot chaotic, I'm not sure. Let me, let me move on to uh, one of the other things we wanted to talk about as a group, right, was just this notion that people have had such different responses to the pandemic, right? And that, that covers everything from where are they getting their information, if they're still actively seeking information. I mean, Bethany, you referred to that earlier. Um, but what are their sources for information? And how are they responding to the situation? And I, I don't know about all of you, but certainly it feels like to me in this third wave, um, people's People were far more volatile this time round, right? It was far more of a big deal in terms of what was being asked of them or could they handle it and where were they getting their information and what were reliable sources of information. Um, thinking too around, uh, it was Viola back, you know, 15 months more than that ago, um, 2019 in December, I can remember you saying to me, Megan, we should be paying attention to Wuhan. 
Um, and I was very much, oh, it's just another flu. And you kept saying to me, no, no, it's bigger, it's bigger. Um, so there is something around what are your sources of information and how, how do you see people responding? So Viola, I'm gonna start with you. I mean, what, what do you see around you? What have you noticed in yourself in terms of where do you look for information? And, and what, what kind of responses do you see in people to the pandemic and how has that changed? Um, actually, my piano, my piano teacher also brought that up to me that I am the first person noticing this uh, virus or this news, I'd say. And um, I think because um, I'm looking for information from both um, like Chinese ch channels, but also English channels. And I have to say that they're both valuable channels. And although it's very confusing when I'm still trying to understand what's going on and what are the differences and uh, what are their focus um, in, term, in terms of topics and um, also the progress of the investigation and the progress of understanding. And so like in the start of pandemic, when, I, when it was like um, early in March, when the Chinese channels are already kind of um, telling you what are the uh, correct way of wearing masks and disposing masks, but um, really the English channels, they're having a big debate whether it's like we should wear a ma mask. And honestly, I think it's also a good learning process for me. And um, I have to say that I cannot dispose um, any of the channel. And um, I definitely learn a lot of things through both channels. And um, so in terms of watching news, um, I know like, uh, Sometimes when you, especially when you're staying at home, you're spending a lot of time just scrolling through the news and especially scrolling through a lot of bad news. And um, that could be some really traumatic experience. And that actually has a psychological term, which is like vicarious trauma. I searched it, I Google it. <laughs> and uh, especially as then like HSP as a highly sensitive pers uh, personality, I really experienced that and I really find there was a time that I watched too much news and never stopped myself. I just don't know why I feel so depressed and I don't have any energy to really do something that I should work on or really being able to think through um, like among all the kind of news that's just um, dumping into my mind. And um, and I think one thing I realized is to kind of also it's a process of learning um, about myself and self re reflective of um, my feelings and what are the, the amount of news I need to kind of knowing what's going on and really realize watching the news is just a, a, an information channel and not really echo the feeling of other people, especially like you're likely to echo the most extreme um, scenarios and when that that are seen you see in the yes. news, right? Yeah. And um and in, in terms of like misinformation and conspiracy and all the things like that, um first of all I think it's a very human reaction and that actually makes sense to me. And uh, people behave differently under pressure and it's the same pressure we're going through right now. Um and the other thing is that um, I think even the X generation like us who grew up um, adopting technology, people are more educated in searching information. Um, and I say most people are expert in that sense, but um, the skill of fact checking or source tracking is not uh, comparably up to speed. And probably we should also learn how to filter information along with finding information. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a like that. fascinating point, actually, right? The idea that the, there's a generation, right? Younger folks, much, much better at finding that information, but maybe don't have quite the same level of skill in terms of being able to assess and filter where the sources are from. That's, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, but there is a whole range, right? And I, and I appreciate, right? You're kind of saying everybody's under pressure. Everybody's sort of sorting it through. So understanding where conspiracy theories come from. I also know that Bethany um, has some thoughts about that when it impacts her the, at the grocery store. <laughs> yes, well, we were just talking about pets. So my dogs are having a bit of a thing. So if you hear some uh, growling, don't worry uh -huh. about it. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, 
when we had this earlier conversation, the discussion came up about meeting people with on common ground um, on this kind of thing. So I don't, I think it's very interesting, especially to have this conversation about filtering your news sources with university students, because I feel like a lot of what we're taught to do is to question and is this a valid source and how do you know that it's a valid source like I feel like that's a really key part of university education. Um, but ultimately my opinion about finding common ground is there are places to do it and that place is not in the grocery store. Um, and I would like you to wear a mask because if you don't, you're putting me and all of my coworkers and my whole family and all of my coworkers' families at risk. And uh, I like, there is a law and that is the law. And I don't like, I don't have as much sympathy for people who are into conspiracy theories in the grocery store because they're yelling at me about how they don't want to wear a mask because haven't I heard that you don't get any oxygen because it's not the place with people who are working minimum wage working long hours on their feet like I don't feel like that is the place to have that conversation and I I think that it is a totally valid thing for um all of my other panelists who brought it up of finding common ground with these people and understanding where they're coming from. But there comes a line and that line is my safety and my family's safety. And for me, that's where I sit with it. It's an interesting point, right? This idea of, yeah, university students should be particularly good at assessing stuff. But I know I have a couple of students that I, none of none of the current panelists, some of the other students that I meet with, um, who are at times often when I meet with them, will, will find themselves um, saying some more of the kind of the anti-mask conspiracy stuff. And then when I push it a little bit, um, we'll, we'll end up, they anyway are in the position where they'd say, well, if somebody else is going to be frightened by this, or I'm going to, you know, make them feel uncomfortable, of course, I'll put on a mask. Um, but then they will also say to me, Megan, if I'm going down these roads, and I am educated and bright, what's happening to people who do not have education, right? Because I'll challenge it a bit, and then they'll come back. But I think it's a bit of the danger of when you are just sitting on your own in front of the screen. Um, and it's a difficult one. I don't know, Kendra or Devin, do you want to chime in at all? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll add on to what uh, Bethany was uh, saying too. Uh, I think especially Bethany, I, I know you're um, studying SDS or social development studies and I have a, a similar academic background and I, and I think it's a especially challenging topic when our academic background like tells us that we should um, like meet people and situations with, with patience and empathy and see the humanity and like the diversity of reactions that people have and and like Viola really um, intelligently pointed out denial is like a very human reaction to a traumatic situation um, but similarly to Bethany like last last summer I was working in a service industry where I was seeing people every day having one-on-one -on -one interactions. So it's really challenging when there are like real consequences to people's actions or, or inactions and there, it really feels like it. And there are real lives and health and, and safety um, at stake. Uh, so yeah, in the face of all that, maintaining wellness um, is certainly difficult and uh, I, I think for me, um, being able to like sit in really unsettling and discomforting places like intellectually um, is, is where I'm, I'm trying to find myself lately or, or at least um, start to grapple with. But of course, that's a lot easier for me to do right now when I'm working from home and I don't have to be going out as often. So uh, yeah, and that's and that's something I'm I'm conflicted about as well, and recognizing like my own privilege within being able to do all my work in the comfort of my room. <laughs> and and I'm thinking of Devon and her particular focus in her undergrad studies. <laughs> 
and the impact that I suspect that has also had on your response to the pandemic. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of my like personal reaction has been informed. I I do um, my focus um, for my undergrad thesis was in natural hazards adaptation. So like a big part of how I look at things and all of my co-ops were in public service. So um, doing infrastructure work and stuff. So like I, when the restrictions and stuff were coming out, I'm like, how do I have any kind of professional integrity left if I look at this regulation in an extreme circumstance, which is not like the natural hazards that I was looking at, but is very similar in a lot of ways. Like I, I could have no professional integrity for the rest of my career if I go, no, I don't think that applies to me. Like that, I, I didn't find that to be a tenable position. So I'm like, well, I guess I'm following all of the rules, which <laughs> was fine. And I mean, yeah, so I, I have been trying to have empathy with people. It, my line does tend to get drawn though when they put other people in danger, but the, the sentence, when they aren't directly doing harm to other people, the sentence that has been getting me through is not my circus, not my monkeys. So that's Lovely. kind of been my philosophy on that. That's lovely. I, I'm looking at the time. We're coming up for 20 after eight. So I do want to sort of um, allow if there are any time for comments or questions, but I do want to just ask one last one, um, which is that very much at the moment, right, the emphasis is uh, we're seeing vaccination as the way out, as the way back to normality. So I'm just really curious about all of you um, and where you're at in terms of vaccinations. And if you want to say anything about that and what's behind that motivation, I mean, certainly I'll let you know I've had one dose uh, um, so far, waiting for my, my ability to do my second dose. I live in Stratford, not a hot spot, So it's a little slower for me to get the second dose, but maybe that's a good thing. Uh, Bethany, do you want to chime in first? Um, yeah, so for me, like one of the big struggles with this whole vaccination thing was, um, especially I qualified under a different situation so I could get my first vaccination before a lot of my co-workers and I really struggled with that um, my mom is a teacher she works with spec ed students um, and she was able to get her vaccination before I was and it is not that I do not think that teachers were not higher at risk but certainly there was a feeling of okay but they've just shut down all the schools for you um, and my coworkers are going home to, you know, their families and we're still not eligible for that. And how, um, having now had my first dose and also waiting on my second one, um, although who knows when that will be, um, it certainly was, you know, like I have a lot of trust in public health and Health Canada that they are making the choices that make sense for the country and they are not trying to hurt me or cause anyone harm. Um, but it is hard to swallow when you sit around and you look at you know the numbers. We have a quarter of a million people come through the store every week. And if you're there 40 hours a week, like I don't know how many people I interact with. Um, and to have been pushed, like to see all my coworkers around me, the real question of what equity looks like mm -hmm. in these jobs. Um, and you know, like the waste disposal people too, like I were like, they still have the signs up. You're still not supposed to put anything that has touched your mouth in there. But I, I've certainly forgotten about my paper straws once in a while. Um, and what does like equity in vaccination look like right now, especially in regards to what we consider essential work? The flip side is, is I certainly know people who, you know, and I, I clergy colleagues, right? Uh, we qualified because we do a fair bit of home and visiting and funerals, that kind of piece that goes along with this line of work. 
um, but who said, who were aware of things like grocery store workers who weren't getting it, and were like, so I'm going to hold off my vaccine. Um, at, with, you know, actually bureaucrats don't really care if you're holding off your vaccine. They just would like to get as many people as possible vaccinated as fast as possible, was the reminder that I think we heard loud and clear. Uh, what about the rest of you? Devin, where are you at in terms of vaccinations? I have got my first dose of the vaccine. I'm very happy about it. Um, I don't know if the vaccines are like the best things that humans have ever done, but they're very close to the top, um, in my opinion, at least. And like, I, I heard someone um, kind of liken it to the feeling of going to, into the vaccine clinic, into voting at a polling station on election day, that feeling of kind of like civic duty and having finally something that I could do. It's like, it, I've spent the last year where the thing that I could do for the common good was stay home and not go anywhere, which felt very passive. And having one thing that I could do that was helpful was great. And I enjoyed it very much. That's a really good point, right? One of the, the jokes, one of the memes that was doing the rounds, right, was in the Second World War, you were asked to go fight. You just get asked to stay home and watch Netflix. And can you do that? <laughs> Viola, where are you at on, on this, on the vaccination piece? And um, I also got my first dose and waiting for my second one, which is scheduled in September the 10th. And uh, what motivates me to get vaccinated? I actually don't really fear of getting the COVID because I think I can survive it, <laughs> but I really want to dine out or really watch a movie. And also I think I, I know that I, it has to be like a certain percentage in the population to get vaccinated for us to be able to do that. Yeah, there's a need to have enough people vaccinated, right, for other activities. And and last but not least, Kendra. Uh, yeah, it's funny, Devin, that you um, mentioned that it feels like voting because I was going to say the exact same thing. Like it, it for me, I, I got my first uh, vaccine a few weeks ago, and, and it really felt like I was like participating in like some like democratic process and I was we were like all lined up and people like got stickers afterwards and stuff like it, it really felt like I was at the polling station um for some reason but uh as as Bethany was mentioning uh in terms of equity and the vaccine uh that's that's definitely an issue in Canada but but also like around the world and, and like I'm, I'm reminded of how like stratified like vaccine availability is and there are like so many countries, like especially like in the global south that have barely been able to vaccinate anyone. So there's like certainly mixed feelings about it. And I feel like very lucky and fortunate and like excited at the prospect of Canada being able to open up again and, and gain, like Megan was saying, some sort of normalcy. Um, but at the same time, like I, I feel like conflicted in like a sense of like worldly grief um, because that isn't the reality everywhere and it won't be the reality everywhere for, for a long time. Yeah, and, and that, I mean, even just from a self-interested point of view, you know, there's, there's a part of me wishes that we could, we in the, you know, the, the wealthy West, that we could see some of that, that actually even for our own self-interest that needs to be, the vaccines need to be getting out more. There's only about five minutes or so left. I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but if there are questions or comments that people would like to put in, I think we're quite open to that. Um, even if it's just, you know, you'd like to add in to some of the, the things uh, that have been commented on, some of the areas. Um, we're so glad somebody else showed up, though we would have enjoyed this conversation anyway. <laughs> I would have, maybe the four panelists wouldn't have, but I would have enjoyed this. It's It's been lovely um, to have a little bit more in-depth analysis and reflection on what it's been like um, for the last 15 months. So I really appreciate that. Um, give people just another minute, um, but... But thank you all for, thank you. So thank you for showing up to, to keep us company as we talked. Oh, look, there are a couple of things. Um, yeah, so we have one from uh, Carrie. Nice to have you here, Carrie. Thank you so much for sharing. I have found that when we share, we also validate feeling and emotions. Yes. Ah, here is a question from Paul. How has online learning affected your perceptions of academic integrity? 
Um, do you get the sense more people are cheating? <laughs> I'd love to hear you guys thoughts on that. It gets really tricky when the the expectations aren't outlined. It is very difficult. I think I think a lot of professors didn't fully consider how to translate like a test, for example, online in a way that made sense. And so like there, I know there were a lot of gray areas that people mm. were like, I don't know if that's actually cheating or not. <laughs> that's <laughs> a really good point. Cause it's it also was just different. never clarified. Mm -hmm. What about the rest of you? Any other new perceptions in terms of uh, academic integrity? Do you think people are cheating? I think like, especially for tests, it's a lot easier to just um, keep your textbook close by. I think uh, the time limits that are put on tests are an attempt to approach that. But I'm also someone who is of the opinion that it is how you apply the knowledge rather than rote memorization that is important and how you integrate that into your conversation. Um, that's more important than whether you have memorized. No, that's a, it's a good insight, Bethany. Thank you. Kendra, you were going to jump in too. Uh, yeah, like being on the other side of that and, and yes. being part of the, the marking team, uh, I, I think being all online has uh, encouraged uh, some educators to reevaluate how they structure courses and the, and the ways that they ask questions and, and the ways they evaluate students. Uh, where I, I think within university settings, we're kind of locked into this idea that we have a couple tests, an assignment, and an exam, and, and that's the structure of the course. But in reality, there's a lot of different ways, even within an online setting, to evaluate a student. Like um, this this semester alone, I've had like a lot more like kind of video based and more creative um, assignments and stuff, and which all honestly led um, lended a lot better to the way I learn, um, and I'm sure was a lot more enjoyable to mark. <laughs> as well, rather than marking the same question 50 times. Um, but yeah, like in, in my experience marking, at, some, at least in the classes I marked, I didn't see any instances of academic um, disintegrity, I guess. I think there's, we're learning a lot about how to evaluate, right? That's my sense, um, a lot about what it means to evaluate. Two other questions. So the first one, uh, hi ladies, great discussion. What has been the main thing you learned coming out of this pandemic? <laughs> Curious, what, do, what would you guys answer? Bethany. I, I got it. Uh, it's okay to not be 100%. Um, it was very especially because it was asynchronous, I felt a lot of pressure on myself. I don't know if anyone else that because I could always choose the time I had to be perfect when I was doing it. I'm also a recovering perfectionist. So like there's that too. Um, but I felt like I had to be a hundred percent every time I went online, even though you know, there were only, you know, there was maybe half an hour during the week that I would feel at 100%. And so learning to be okay with being at 70% when, you know, like when you have a class on Monday at 10 o'clock, you have a class on Monday at 10 o'clock, it doesn't matter if you're feeling, not feeling the material, um, you have to do it. But there was very much, uh, for me, having to learn to be okay with not being totally there and that that was actually a strength instead of a weakness. That's good. Anybody else? What have you learned during the pandemic? Uh, I, I think similar to uh, Bethany, it's uh, giving myself a little bit more grace and, and uh, self-compassion. The same, um, yeah, yes, same, same as Bethany with 
being okay with not working 100% of the time because I, I feel like when I live with roommates and stuff there's naturally times where I put the books down or shut my laptop and like socialize with other people where when it's just like me in my room I have like no gauge of how much my classmates are working or how much my prof is working and I always have this mentality of uh, they're doing more work than me I better like get going I better get moving but of course that's that's not always true uh so yeah I think giving myself a bit more grace and and being able to like just lie down some days and, and relax and, and recognizing that there's value in, in doing that as well mm -hmm. that's really good yes uh Viola or Devin what, what have you learned in this pandemic I think I, lear I learned a lot about um, talking with myself and um, also kind of working things out with myself. Because I think a lot of times I don't, like before, I don't really kind of dig into my thoughts. Like we, I put uh, my feelings into basket that this is called anger, this is called stress. And I never discuss with myself that why am I, am I feeling this? And, uh, what sh and even just being concerned talking to myself constructively, even though the times are hard and you don't have so much energy to be even constructive with yourself. And uh, even just stating the fact and uh, be honest with yourself and the real honest, um, even killing off the darkest part and going through some of the hardest times um, that uh, maybe in a month, in a week, and still be honest and still that talking to yourself, like acknowledge the problem, aware of the feelings and, and, and comfort yourself and saying that it's okay. It's something I learned. That's good. Yeah, very common themes here. Devin. I've been trying to think the whole time because it like, it's, it's hard to pull one thing out of it. I mean, I think the biggest skill set I've come out with is being able to manage myself and my time and my expectations but also in kind of a more abstract way one of the big things I've learned is that I think a lot of self a lot of like my self-respect comes with comes from making decisions that are consistent with my values and that's been an interest like on a whole spectrum of levels from like what kind of choices you make have a big influence on kind of where you end up based on kind of like what you want to be doing, which has been interesting to think about. That's really good. I just want to touch base quickly with Nancy. I know we're a little over 8.30, but I'm hoping it's okay. We just have two more questions. So maybe we'll just look at those briefly, if that's okay, Nancy. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you just want to finish yeah. off those questions, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so the next question, um, when we think of the pandemic, loss is a common theme. What has the student experience been like for you getting involved during a pandemic? I mean, we'll just do it fairly briefly, but is there anyone who would like to respond to that? What's it been like to get involved um, during a pandemic? Devin. One thing that I did was I signed up as a peer mentor for incoming first years in my program because um, like, like you mentioned about kind of the things that are lost in the pandemic, I went like, I, I didn't love having my last year of university being online, but I wouldn't, I don't know how I would have done if my first year had been because I didn't have all those skills that I'd learned for the first four years. So I signed up um, for that so that I could help the incoming students try to navigate that because I knew how important upper years had been to me. So that's kind of how I got involved with the kind of pandemic experience of, of other people. That's really interesting. Yeah, kind of identifying it would have been very different early on. Anybody else want to jump in in terms of student experience pieces? Uh, I think I spoke a little bit earlier. Um, that has certainly been something that I am not, I have not, I've really struggled with. Um, I really felt like I was starting to find my footing about really finding a community on campus. Um, that had not been something that I had really developed for a while. 
Um, and then I like, I, I really do feel like I completely lost that aspect of school um, during the pandemic. I kept that at work, but I lost that at school. Um, and so like, I don't, we'll see. <laughs> like Still to be continued. Loss is an okay observation that that part has just been lost. Yeah. yeah. One last question uh, from a student perspective. What would you want profs to know about online learning? <laughs> Are there any specific improvements that they should be making? Specific, I'm not sure about, but I would say listen to your students. Um, I feel like, especially for experienced profs, there's this idea that uh, they know. And I think being in academia involves a lot of humility um, and a lot of reflexivity. And just because you've taught an online class for the past 10 years, doesn't mean that it's the same as teaching an online class during a pandemic and having the humility to recognize that and to take feedback from students seriously and um, without being defensive or, or, or hurt by it, uh, I, I think would be my number one recommendation. That's a really interesting one. Just because you've done online courses before, it doesn't mean it's the same in a pandemic. And to listen. Yeah, that's a hard one for all of us. Anybody else? What would what would you wish profs would know? Um, so I, I think um, video lectures helps a lot. And um, so I guess it's a good teaching approach, um, adding on to the notes. And especially if you can have a little bit introduction or overview um, at the beginning of every week's lesson that really helps me to understand what I'm going to learn um, throughout the week and even what are some materials I should go through. And another thing I find helpful is also maybe having yourself recorded, um, maybe put yourself in a corner that helps you feel more engaged in lesson. And in terms of assignments, I think um, I prefer to have like some assignments maybe every like weekly or bi-weekly assignments, then um, like there's only test there um, because I think it's a good tool to help me keep track of my learning process and help me understand what are, thing, what are the things I should um, can, kind of know about and testing, also testing my knowledge when there's probably weird kind of lack of reference from peers and also lack of reference um, from professors as well. So that could be a good reference for me. Well, that's helpful. Anybody else, Bethany or Devin, thoughts about profs? One thing I think I learned from my online classes uh, between two different kinds was the two, I took uh, two religious studies courses as electives, um, Islam and uh, religions of East Asia. And they were, used to be like they've been offered online for a very long time and the thing I noticed between them and my other lectures was that I really enjoyed those ones because they made use of what they had at their disposal so we had podcasts we had websites we had YouTube videos and they they took it as a different medium and made the best of what they had instead of trying to make it a watered down version of something it wasn't um, which I, like there's, I, I totally understand why that happened for all of the people who desperately scrambled to, to put anything together for their students. And I'm so, um, I'm so grateful for how many great professors I've had and so how much they cared and how much work they put in, um, to make, to making that work for us. But there are opportunities as well as struggles that some classes did a really good job with. So kind of embracing that would be my recommendation. Uh, okay, I, I just have to jump in now because this was my whole thing before. Um, so I'm just gonna try and synthesize some of my earlier points, which is that discussions online don't work the same way as discussions in class do. And we can't, 
I think we want them to. We really want them to, but they don't. And there's a real lack of understanding about the difference of time commitment between a discussion in a classroom and a discussion online, especially when there are word count issues with that. Um, and you also, like you just miss so much stuff. So uh, we need to rethink discussion posts online. Um, <laughs> like there's between 10 and 15% of all of my marks are discussion posts. So like, I th this is really something that I'm on the fence about. I also think that, um, I, I love what Devin said about taking advantage of the medium um, and, you know, like we're, we're all coming at this um, having gone through the trauma of being in a pandemic and doing school through that. And I think um, certainly I think my profs are more aware of that because of the program that I'm in. Um, but I think when we get stuck in academia, uh, instead of looking at it from a holistic point of view, we get really stuck in academia. And I think that there was great, um, like I think that there's a reason that we move towards a more holistic view of education and it's because it works and it's important and all of those pieces are important and that we need, we, we've more or less figured out how to do school online, more for some people, less for others. Um, but I think that we need to look at integrating a more holistic approach to education when it's online, because there are certainly ways to take what could be deficits and make them strengths. Um, but I don't know, I, I, I think we're, we're also all stuck in this time and like, who knows? Um, so like the profs are doing great. <laughs> you just need to rethink some things and figure out how this fits with what is our new societal views about how we do education well. I, I think that I'm certainly hearing from all of you loud and clear. You do have some thoughts about what works and what doesn't from a student perspective, but I'm not hearing just general griping about profs at all. I think all of you are so aware we're all in this. It's all asked a lot of everyone. Um, I want to thank the four of you uh, for taking another evening online, <laughs> sitting in front of a computer or a phone, and to, to take this time and to talk with me. I, I was just delighted when each of you said yes to my invitation to be part of this panel. Really appreciate the, the different perspectives, even though we've discovered there's a lot in common, um, but also the differences between all four of you. So I just want to really say a big thank you to all four of you. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. And Nancy, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Megan, um, for moderating, Kendra, um, Viola, Bethany, and Devin. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. That was a great discussion and really, really insightful. Um, I want to thank Renison uh, University College for uh, this partnership with Waterloo Public Library and always bringing really interesting topics um, to all of you. And um, with that, I it's that it's that time we're going to say goodbye thanks everyone <laughs> take care bye